director of the program on transatlantic relations at uh, Harvard University. And um, I want to thank the organizers, particularly Thierry, for having me here, for having us, uh, um, allowing us to have this panel uh, with, uh, with the young leaders of the conference. We're going to address a set of issues that interlink uh, innovation, change, disruption, and political economy, sort of uh, that's the overarching theme of the panel. Uh, I'm going to give a diagnosis of where I think innovation is and how it's affecting our political life. So I'm going to try to land some of the debates that we've been having on innovation and change and look at their political consequences. It's just going to be a diagnosis. And then I'm going to run through the panel. Um, we have a, a group of entrepreneurs and people that are practice oriented. So you, you'll see a big difference between what an academic uh, can make a living out of and then what real uh, entrepreneurs and action people do. So they're, they're going to come up with uh, deep dive analysis and solutions about what's going on. So I'll be quite quick because I don't want to take too much of your time. So I want to start with this graph. I don't know if you've ever seen this, but it, go, it runs from 2000 BC to our time. So it's 4,000 years of history. And the two lines you see, one is world population and the other one is social development index, which is a measure of material wealth. And essentially you have them pretty flat scientific revolution, industrial revolution, and boom, right? Both skyrocket. So we live uh, on that curve of accelerated change, both in terms of population and material wealth. This is the same graph in world GDP in trillions. So again, 10,000 years of history, boom, right? In terms of our capacity to uh, uh, essentially have economic development, there's only one significant historical development, which is the application of science and technology to the economy and to productive processes. Uh, this is happening because of Moore's law. This is one of the big drivers, which is the collapse in uh, the cost of processing power. McKinsey Global Institute has cataloged the various vectors where this change is taking place into these categories, but you can come up with many others, you know, energy, cloud, uh, robotics, whatever it is, is the convergence of all of these that makes uh, change exponential and very, very hard to predict, right? Now, how do I, how is this related to the theme of the panel? Now, I'm gonna say that this brings many challenges, this rate of change, but I'm going to say that two are particularly uh, important. One is it producing unprecedented shifts in the jobs market, and the other one, it's leading to wage stagnation uh, and growing inequality. Uh, shifts in the labor market have occurred in the past, and they've been produced by technological change. This is uh, the decline of the population, labor force uh, employment in the United States in agriculture from 18, 18, 50, 60 to our time. So it went you know, from the up 60s to uh, you know, three, four percent. At the same time as you had an explosion in productivity. This also happened in manufacturing. This is from the 70s to 2018. This is millions of Americans working in manufacturing and the bars are the installation of robots in, in, in uh, factories in the United States. But now it's starting to happen in services. This is from a report from the, uh, from the uh, Oxford Martin School. And the graph is a little bit hard to read, but essentially about 47% of current jobs are estimated to be in high risk of automation in the next 20 years. These are jobs in translation, in legal services, accounting, tax advisory, self-driving cars, which we're gonna explore later, uh, put at risk about three million jobs just in the United States, right? So this is now affecting services. This might be, I think, the most important graph in the entire presentation. It shows something that has happened from the 70s onwards. This is US data, and it's the decoupling of productivity and hourly wages and labor wages. So from the 70s, our entire economic model is based on this assumption that with increases in productivity, that eventually trickles down to wages, and that feeds into the middle class and creates a solid middle class. From the 70s onwards, this has ceased to work in the United States. So Productivity has increased by 2.4 times, you know, 243%. Hourly compensation has remained stagnant. Uh, as I will say at the end of the presentation, I think this is a breach, a fundamental breach of a social contract, and this has huge implications for the way we think about the future and how to build a new equilibrium. This is producing at a time of growth, because curiously, uh, we live at, the t at a time when we've never been more prosperous. The, the United States returned to pre-crisis GDP levels in 2012. So the United States just elected a president on a platform to break the system at a time when they've never been more prosperous on the aggregate. Uh, but because of that decoupling that I showed you, uh, most of that income is going to capital holders, and this is one of the consequences. This is from a McKinsey Global Institute report titled Poorer Than Their Parents. Up, upwards of 90% of Italian households in that nine year period saw their household income stagnate or decline. That's also true of 80 something percent of US households, 70 something percent of UK households. My thesis in this talk is that this is sort of dynamite right at the heart of our democracies. This is not sustainable uh, politically. 
Uh, this is, um, uh, you know, uh, aggregate uh, income uh, concentration in the top 5% and top 20% of American households in this period from the 70s to today. And this is at the global level, uh, wealth concentration in the top 1% versus the bottom 99% in 2015. It was the first time that the top 1% had more aggregate wealth than the remainder of the planet. And the consequences, and I'm going to fly through these, are in my mind three, although there are many more. One is a growth in anti-systemic sentiment. And I followed the Brexit debate quite closely. This is, this, these bars show you the level of trust in those collectives, econ academics, economies, Bank of England, and people that voted for leave or remain. Essentially, Brexiteers were highly suspicious of experts. There was an avalanche of expert reports saying that Brexit was a bad idea and you still got Brexit. So the breach of trust between the elites and those they represent has been growing and growing, and it's now producing completely unpredictable political outcomes, right? Um, this is about pessimism and optimism and support for Hillary and Trump. So to the question, compared with 50 years ago, life for people like you in America is, you know, Trump supporters, 80-something percent would say it's worse. Uh, while Hillary supporters would be in the, you know, sort of 19. So if you're a pessimist, you know, there's a high chance that, you're, uh, that you prefer Trump as a candidate and those were the people that were ultimately uh, voting for him. I have a short video that uh, explains this in a very visual way. So a final experiment that I want to mention to you is our fairness study. Uh, and so this, this, this became a very famous study, and there's now many more, because after we did this about 10 years ago, uh, it became uh, very well known. And we did that originally with capuchin monkeys, and uh, I'm going to show you the first experiment that we did. It has now been done with dogs, and with birds, and with chimpanzees, um, with, but with Sarah Brosnan, we started out with capuchin monkeys. So what we did is we put two capuchin monkeys side by side. Again, these animals, they live in a group. They know each other. We take them out of the group, put them in a test chamber. And there's a very simple task that they need to do. And if you give both of them cucumber for the task, the two monkeys side by side, they're perfectly willing to do this 25 times in a row. So cucumber, even though it's really only water in my opinion, but cucumber <laughs> is perfectly fine for them. Now, if you give the partner grapes, the, the food preferences of my capuchin monkeys correspond exactly with the prices in the supermarket. And so if you give them grapes, it's a far better food, uh, then you create inequity between them. So that's the experiment we did. Recently, we videotaped it with new monkeys who had never done the task, uh, thinking that maybe they would have a stronger reaction, and that turned out to be right. The one on the left is the monkey who gets cucumber. The one on the right is the one who gets grapes. The one who gets cucumber, note that the first piece of cucumber is perfectly fine. The first piece she eats. Uh, then she sees the other one getting grape, and you will see what happens. So she gives a rock to us. That's the task. And we give her a piece of cucumber, and she eats it. The other one needs to give a rock to us. And that's what she does. And she gets a grape. And she eats it. The other one sees that. She gives a rock to us now, gets again cucumber. This happens a number of times. They do it like 20 times in a row. She tests a rock now against the wall. She needs to give it to us. Yeah, yeah. And she gets cucumber again. So she's testing the rock. Everything is going well. There you go. So this is basically so, uh, the Wall can we, Street can we protest go back to the that you see here. So this, uh, which is a very deep sense of equity and what justice means, is producing this in our societies. At least this is my thesis, right? And these are the barbarians at the gates. Some of them are no longer at the gates, actually. Some of them have broken into the political system. Um, this is support for extreme right and left parties in 33 European countries over this uh, 15, 20-year period. This is the decline of support for the EU as a project uh, across a number of European countries. This is Eurostat data. And this is what the economist has called drawbridges up, which is this anti-liberal era. It's anti-trade, anti-globalization, anti-cosmopolitanism, etc. Why is this anti-liberal? Because liberalism is quite technical. It relies precisely on that trust between elites and the people to be there. It's very long-term. It's very counterintuitive. So the EU and other projects that require a deep and technical analysis and for people to 
uh, trust those people actually negotiating some of these agreements is going to be one of the big victims of this, but also free trade and others. Uh, now, you know, one of the things that I'll just point out very quickly is how deaf liberal elites have been to this entire process. We have, we have built these huge echo chambers for us. We've been uh, quite relaxed about what was going on. In some cases, even ignorant about what was happening to our middle class and the erosion of our middle class. This is our capacity to predict Brexit and the Donald Trump victory, but it's happening many other issues. So the, the, my thesis is that the direct short-term political risks are a weakening of the EU, weakening of NATO, weakening of the global trading regime, which we're gonna see in the next few months. Um, now, you know, in, on trade, this I'm just going to fly by, but I'll, I'll just show you. This graph is what happened to international trade between January 1929 and January 1930, which was the last period where we had this level of interdependence and complexity, and also an anti-trade mood essentially collapsed to a third of what it was in January 1929. So it's a very, international trade is incredibly fragile to tariff wars and revision of treaties, which is precisely what we're, what we're starting to see. Now, the third consequence, and this is the gravest, and here I'll finish and I'll, and I'll, and I'll open uh, the panel and I'll give the word to the panelists, is a collapse in the support for democracy as a system of government. This is, in my mind, the deepest structural consequence of this. This is data from a very recent study by two colleagues at the government department. This is people saying that it's essential to live in a country run in a democracy in the United States. People born in the 1930s and 40s, you know, sort of is up in the 70% of the people saying it was essential. People born in the 1980s, you're down to 20% of the people saying it's essential to live in a democracy. This is, uh, this is the other side of the same coin, which is support for authoritarianism in the United States. In the latest data, about a third of Americans were willing to accept in World Value Survey uh, interview uh, that an authoritarian regime in the United States was something that was desirable. So people have now voted Democratic, Republican, now they've literally voted a, an independent into the White House. If he does not deliver for the people that have been left behind, it's not just the elites and the parties that are being questioned, is the political framework that's starting to be questioned. I think the Trump phenomenon is unexplainable without this data about authoritarianism. Uh, so I'll finish here. I think the driver of what we're seeing is a big structural shift in the structure, in, in the, in the, in the, the structure of the economy, in the way wealth is generated and distributed. I think this is producing a political convulsion uh, of which we're only seeing the beginning. Uh, I think that it's going to have geopolitical consequences, of which we're already seeing some, but fundamentally the weakening of the EU, NATO, and the global trading regime. And I think the solution will require something that will resemble a new social contract. We've been here before, I think. The period is similar to the beginning of the 20th century, where we also had a big shift to the structure, in the structure of the economy. We had the emergence of a new political class. At the time, it was the proletariat. I think in our time, is the precariat. All of these underemployed, subemployed, uh, precariously employed people, those that have lost in the process of technological innovation. And the big question, and I'll leave it here, perhaps we can discuss it later, is how do we build a new equilibrium? What is the equilibrium after the convulsion? Uh, in the case of the 20th century, it was the expansion of uh, the vote, and it was also the um, establishment of the welfare state. In our time, we can have a debate about how that looks, but I think that the fundamental message uh, for me is that this is far more structural than we think, and we need to think very deeply about uh, how these dynamics are interplaying and what the consequences are. And I'll leave you with a final note. The liberal order is a huge generator of prosperity. We have basically found the way to eliminate uh, uh, extreme poverty. This is a collapse of people living in extreme poverty in that period of time. This is the same graph, uh, including the increase in population in the lighter blue. So we've almost, we've managed to reduce extreme poverty at an incredible rate at a time of population growth. So the system, the rule of law, free trade, all of these things is an incredible generator of wealth. So what we're literally failing at the management of prosperity. I mean, it's a, it's a failure of intelligence what we're going through right now. Uh, and this is GDP, uh, world GDP per capita in that period, right? Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is David. I'm an entrepreneur from China. Uh, today, I wanted to just talk about a very specific thing, how a specific technology go about disrupting the world. So uh, my company name is Hesai, as we were originally founded in the Silicon Valley, and now we're in China. And we make different type of laser sensors, and we have different applications. Today, I want to share two examples of the technologies and the product we make and its changes and the impacts on the world. So, 
Before I do that, actually, I want to share a photo. Does anyone recognize this, where this is? Can you raise your hand? All right, a few. <laughs> yeah, this is us. This is Doha. And can anyone believe this is a photo I took yesterday? No? Well, that is true. That is the photo I took yesterday during the coffee break. I had a drone. It, it, it's uh, designed and made by a Chinese company called DJI. I had it with me because it's so small. So I had it, uh, I was like, I wanted to see what's Doha like from me hundreds of meters above. So it took me 20 minutes. I took, uh, I let go of the drone and I had this amazing photo. So a, a point I'm trying to make here is we're looking at things in a different dimension now. While well, you're still trying to make your Ferraris and Lamborghinis run faster, someone else, someone else in California is already making electric car that's way faster than any of the existing gasoline cars. While well, you're trying to push the limit for those electric cars, maybe, or this is actually true, someone in China is making your car fly. So, I think in this fast evolving world, we're trying to see things in a different dimension where you can jump out of this 2D dimension and to look at it in a different angle and you come to a complete different solution and it is always disruptive. So today, uh, I want to show you two uh, products our company has been working on and how this technologies has been able to disrupt or at least make, make people change their minds about the existing industry. Briefly background about my company. So three of us, um, we were originally founding this company in the Silicon Valley as we were discovering this new laser technology, Smian and partner, we uh, got this um, from Stanford University and then we made this product out of those research results. And then we realized that using laser, we can do a lot more things than, than the lab could. So we decided to take this technology and then we took it back to China and tried to commercialize it. So this is the first product we made. It actually has a lot of things to do with oil and gas. So traditionally, if you want to inspect um, gas pipelines or gas stations or any leaks, you have this very bulky and uh, some, way, some way backward machine, you do that. But now, we work with the best drone company in the world and we provide the laser product on top of it. Now we put it together to a fully autonomous system. This drone, it's able to autonomously inspect gas pipelines, gas stations, to find out leaks and then return without any human intervention. And we are the first one in the world to commercialize this product. And it's a very beautiful and mature product. And this is one of the things it's being used for high-rise apartments. If you couldn't get in, my drone can tell you what's a, a, through the glass, what's happening inside the room. And this improves the efficiency by more than 50 times because simply using a drone is much faster than human labor. Also, we worked on another product that's related to the auto industry, as you probably all heard of, uh, for the driverless car. First, maybe I should share a few reasons why driverless car now is so big. There are a couple of reasons people uh, think it is a key factor of this boom of driverless car. First, the sensor, sensor cost has been declining like crazy from the past 10 years. A radar used to cost you about 10,000 US dollars. Now it's in the range of hundreds of dollars. Second, the emergence of artificial intelligence and those deep learning technolo technologies allows people to interpret the results better. It allows, them, it allows the cars to know its problem. And also the change of par paradigm because of the sharing economy. If you think now you buy a car because you want to own a car, in the future, you don't have to own a car. Some other company will own this car and it will pick you up and drop you off 
without you having to purchase it. And that's a huge difference because now you can afford to have smarter and better cars. And last, but of course that's not least, everyone around the world is aware of it. Global legalization has, has very specific times for certain functions to realize. For example, in the United States, by 2022, you have to have AEB, it's uh, automatic emergency braking. That means that even if you want to drive the car onto a wall, your car wouldn't allow you to do that. So with all those given benefits, driverless car becomes reality. But we're not making driverless cars because it's too big of a project. As you know, Google is making driverless cars, Uber is making driverless cars. We're, we, as a small company, we make a very small part of the driverless car. If you ever seen a Google car, on top of the Google car, there is something called a LiDAR. It's a laser sensor. It gives you 3D image of what's around you. Pretend you are the computer in a driverless car. What do you want to know? You wanted to know the exact position and distance and the speed of the objects and the obstacles in front of you. Your, the image processing technologies is not good enough. That's why people rely on laser to do that. A laser can travel to the object and be bounced back, and we analyze the difference, then we know exactly each of you and the obstacles are. Actually, believe it or not, a LiDAR is the most, single most expensive part on a driverless car. The one on the top of a Google car, it costs more than 100,000 US dollars. And that's actually more expensive than the car. And we decided to focus on this part because it is so such a crucial thing. And no more than five companies in the world can make commercially available LiDARs, and we're working on that. And this is actually a result. So just to give you some intuition of how it works, our product's on the bottom right, and if you look at the, there's a black, uh, white Cadillac SUV, our LiDAR is on top of it, and gives you a 3D image. And this is going to make your driverless car 100 times safer, and that's why everyone's using it. And then there are some future applications, because we're not only making essentially the eyes of a robot or any moving object, we're making the brain of it. With our devices, we see objects moving past just in the brain. That's why we also planning to, we're also planning to expand to different applications that essentially helps the world be more automated. I wanted to conclude when, with this slide because now, if you still look at a conventional problem trying to make your car run faster, jump out. There's always a better disruptive technology that's going to give you this perspective that you never had before. And I believe this is opportunity of our time. Thank you. Thank you. Good, good afternoon. My name is Lionel Baraban. I'm the co-founder and CEO of a French company called Famuco. When I arrived here and I read the subject of the, uh, of the session, and it was disruption, technology, and populism. And I started to ask myself, what do I have to say about populism? Perhaps nothing. And I looked at our portfolio of customer and our technology, and here what I found. Uh, oh, sorry. Okay. So basically, populism is a lack of trust. And in the real world, like in the digital world, you need to bring trust. Now, today, trust, the trust technology is for transaction. So we know very well how to secure a financial transaction. If you have a credit card and with your credit card you pay on a POS, the level of fraud today is zero. There is zero fraud when you take a credit card and you actually pay on a POS, not online, but on a POS. Now, today, the need of securing transaction goes much beyond only financial transaction. Crossing a border is a transaction with the government. Voting is a transaction. 
Access control is a transaction. Internet of things. Internet of things, objects are transacting together. Now, we need to bring trust and security between objects and people. Now, let's take how we have applied those concepts to something which is perhaps more familiar to, to your world. That's what we do for the World Food Program. Uh, uh, this is the digitalization of humanitarian vouchers. Uh, uh, today, uh, uh, World Food Program, it is the number one NGO in the world. They're transacting $10 billion every year. They have under management 18 million beneficiaries. And the project is about having 19 million beneficiaries under management. So we give them a card, which is exactly like a credit card, and they can go to merchants with a small POS and approach the card to the POS and see what are the vouchers that are available to them. Uh, by doing that, this is real-time uh, monitoring and tracking of the transaction. But now, if you think about what it means exactly, is we have created a new money. A new money that has more trust than the actual money. A money where you can build a purpose inside the money. So the big disruption in fintech is not putting more application around the money, but is the fact that the money itself becomes an application. So this new money that has been invented with the United Nations is a money where you can say, I'm a donor, I'm gonna give you $100, but I want those $100 to be used for food, not for munitions, not for alcohol, not for tobacco. I want those $100 to be used for books for your kids, not to buy a flat screen TV. Now, you can also create a date. Those $100 must be, must be used in the next 30 days. We can also create education against food. If that kid goes to school more than 100 days per year, the family is going to get food. So by changing the paradigm, by creating a money that has a purpose, that the money that becomes an application, we build trust between the donors and the beneficiaries. Now, I happened on this conference to, to meet uh, uh, Dr. Arakat, and I'm sure that if he can prove to the donors of the refugees that he has now a way to make sure that the money is going to be used properly, or what he was intended for, that is a good step forward uh, towards stability. So building trust in the digital economy is, I believe, a way to fight populism in our real world. Thank you very much. My name is Caroline. I'm one of the co-founders of DataVise, which is a company specialized in data visualization and human data interactions. So I'm going to speak in French, so please put your headphones. Okay. Dans ma société DataVise, uh, on travaille à améliorer la relation entre les humains et les données. C'est-à-dire que notre travail au quotidien, c'est de faire en sorte que eh ben, les gens soient plus à l'aise pour comprendre les données, pour travailler avec les données et plus généralement pour vivre avec les données au quotidien. Et le fait même qu'il existe des équipes comme la mienne qui sont spécialisées sur ce sujet de la relation entre les humains et les données, eh ben c'est bien la preuve que cette relation elle va pas de soi. Et ce que je vais essayer de faire cet après-midi, c'est de vous faire un petit état des lieux de cette relation entre humains et données en lien avec les sujets de, de la journée. Alors, pour commencer, pourquoi on parle beaucoup des données aujourd'hui C'est parce qu'elles ont connu une très forte massification au cours des dernières années. Ces données, elles sont désormais partout, dans beaucoup de, dans beaucoup de supports d'information. C'est devenu la façon privilégiée d'encapsuler l'information qui circule autour de nous et qui circule dans des volumes très importants. 
Alors ça, ça représente des opportunités euh, fantastiques. Euh, C'est ce que beaucoup ont pensé, dont je fais partie. Ça représente des opportunités pour euh, les entreprises, tout d'abord. Des opportunités pour euh, améliorer euh, leur productivité, pour améliorer leur process. Des opportunités pour améliorer la façon dont ils répondent aux besoins de leurs clients, euh, pour améliorer leur business model. Des opportunités aussi pour, euh, eh ben, pour trouver de nouvelles façons d'innover. Et donc, on peut prendre par exemple le cas de Procter Gamble qui a équipé 50 000 de ses salariés avec un outil de visualisation de ses données marketing pour aider ces personnes-là à prendre de meilleures décisions au quotidien, à avoir des décisions plus éclairées. Les données, ça représente aussi une forte opportunité pour les organisations publiques et en particulier à travers ce courant qu'on appelle Open Data. Donc, c'est l'ouverture des données publiques au plus grand nombre, entreprises et citoyens. Et ça, ça représente des opportunités intéressantes de changer les relations entre euh, gouvernants et, euh, et citoyens, entre élus et, et grand public. Euh, et donc, euh, on peut voir par exemple des villes comme New York qui ont non seulement ouvert des jeux de données significatifs, mais qui ont aussi euh, mis en place les conditions pour créer des expérimentations, des programmes euh, qui vont associer euh, les entreprises, les citoyens et les élus euh, dans l'utilisation de ces données. Les données, c'est aussi une formidable entreprise pour les villes. C'est l'opportunité de devenir des « smart cities », comme on dit, des villes intelligentes, euh, des villes qui vont être mieux capables d'affronter les défis du développement humain, euh, d'être mieux capables de faire face aux ressources naturelles limitées en optimisant leur réseau euh, euh, grâce à l'utilisation de données de capteurs, grâce à l'optimisation de ces données et, et leur traitement, et une décentralisation également de la gestion. Donc on peut citer euh, comme exemple Barcelone, qui a été élu parmi les villes les plus smart du monde récemment, en particulier parce qu'ils gèrent très bien leurs flux routiers et leurs, et leurs éclairages publics grâce à une gestion optimisée des données. Les données, c'est aussi une opportunité pour tout le monde, pour le, le plus grand nombre au quotidien, chez soi. C'est l'opportunité d'avoir des assistants intelligents, d'avoir des, des objets un petit peu malins qui vont nous faciliter la vie du quotidien. Alors L'exemple qu'on prend souvent, c'est celui des, capteurs, des compteurs intelligents, euh, celui des, des thermostats qui vont euh, s'adapter euh, aux données de notre environnement, à nos données personnelles, pour euh, nous aider à faire des économies d'énergie, pour nous aider à mieux gérer notre consommation d'électricité. Et plus généralement, euh, cette formidable opportunité des données, c'est celle de comprendre des choses qu'on n'aurait pas compris jusque-là. Un petit peu comme, euh, vous savez, il y a des sons que l'oreille humaine ne peut pas saisir. Et ben dans, dans la façon dont est organisé notre monde aujourd'hui, il y a des choses qu'on ne peut pas quantifier, qu'on ne peut pas qualifier euh, sans garder les données. Et donc, c'était cette promesse que les données, elles allaient nous, nous permettre de comprendre des choses qu'on ne comprendrait pas autrement. Donc, un monde plein de promesses, comme vous le voyez. Et pourtant, ce qu'on entend aujourd'hui, ce qu'on ressent, ce qu'on lit dans, dans les médias, ce n'est pas tout à fait ce, ce joli paysage plein d'opportunités. C'est plutôt une série de, de critiques euh, et de suspicions. Alors, je vais prendre quelques exemples euh, tirés de la récente élection américaine puisque cette élection de Donald Trump elle a, elle a jeté un très fort discrédit sur les sondages et plus généralement sur toutes nos méthodologies prédictives, toute notre capacité à anticiper ce qui va se passer grâce aux données. Et ça, c'est embêtant parce qu'on bah, on s'est rendu compte que les données ici, elles ne nous avaient pas servi à mieux comprendre le monde, elles nous avaient plutôt éloignés de la réalité de terrain. Et dans la, dans la, dans la foulée de cette élection, il y a aussi beaucoup de critiques qui sont apparues sur l'algorithme de Facebook, donc l'algorithme qui organise le newsfeed, la page où les gens consultent leur information, euh, parce qu'en fait, cet algorithme, il a été accusé de propager des informations fausses euh, qui encourageaient le populisme. Et là aussi, en fait, c'est un phénomène qu'on observe depuis déjà pas mal de temps, c'est ce qu'on appelle des bulles de filtres, c'est-à-dire que les données personnelles que les internautes laissent en ligne en consultant différents supports, elles sont utilisées pour personnaliser l'information qui est présentée aux internautes. Et donc, euh, on présente de l'information toujours plus personnalisée, qui est censée euh, être la plus intéressante possible pour la personne qui la lit. Mais en faisant ça, on isole aussi les utilisateurs, les internautes, bah, dans un univers où ils ne sont plus confrontés à des opinions extérieures, ils ne sont plus confrontés à d'autres idées. Et on voit que là aussi, l'utilisation des données, elle ne sert pas à une meilleure connaissance du monde, elle sert à un rétrécissement de, de notre connaissance du monde. Et peut-être un, un autre sujet tiré, un autre exemple tiré de, de cette élection américaine, euh, ce qu'elle qu peut nous montrer, c'est aussi notre difficulté à, à faire société. Alors, c'est sans doute quelque chose qu'on observe aux États-Unis, en, en Europe et, et en France euh, en particulier. Euh, alors, je ne vais pas euh, rentrer dans les mécanismes sociologiques ou philosophiques qui peuvent m'amener à, à, à dire ça, 
Mais si on regarde vraiment juste du côté des données, euh, aujourd'hui, on a la capacité à collecter des données à un niveau beaucoup plus fin qu'autrefois, à l'échelle des individus. Donc, on peut faire de, de, des statistiques à l'échelle individuelle. Et donc, dans ce contexte-là, ça n'a plus beaucoup de sens de euh, parler de grandes catégories de population. Les classes sociales, ça n'existe plus vraiment quand on regarde les données. Euh, pareil pour l'idée de nation. Ce qu'on voit quand on regarde des données à un niveau aussi fin, ce qui est désormais possible, eh ben, c'est une infinité de motifs individuels, une infinité de, de patterns euh, dans lesquels on ne retrouve plus forcément euh, des choses communes qui, nous font, euh, qui vont nous aider à faire société. Il y a plein d'autres exemples que je pourrais prendre. Euh, Facebook, euh, Google sont, récemment, enfin, sont très régulièrement euh, euh, critiqués pour les changements dans leurs algorithmes parce que ces, grandes, ces grands géants du web utilisent les données personnelles des internautes, donc les données que ces internautes laissent sur les services en ligne, et elles ne le font pas forcément avec la transparence qu'il faudrait, avec la pédagogie qu'il faudrait ou la déontologie qu'il faudrait pour que les utilisateurs ne se sentent pas un petit peu pris au piège ou ne se sentent pas en danger du point de vue de leur, de leur protection de leur vie privée ou de leur, ou de leur capacité à, à se faire oublier. On a un dernier exemple, peut-être plus sur la déontologie, euh, si on regarde les voitures connectées, une voiture connectée, c'est un système qui utilise énormément de données et c'est un système bah, qui devient très compliqué. Euh, c'est difficile pour euh, la plupart d'entre nous de comprendre comment fonctionne une voiture autonome. Et pourtant, ces voitures autonomes, elles vont être amenées à, à gérer des situations qu'on aurait gérées nous-mêmes sinon. Imaginons que vous soyez sur une route très étroite euh, dans votre voiture autonome et un, un bus scolaire arrive en face vous ne pouvez pas l'éviter, l'accident est inévitable. Et qu'est-ce qui, qu qui va se passer Qu'est-ce que votre voiture autonome va faire Est-ce qu'elle va choisir d'épargner le bus scolaire et les dizaines d'enfants Ou est-ce qu'elle va privilégier, vous, le conducteur de cette voiture Ces questions-là, euh, imaginons que dans la réalité, vous ayez le temps de vous poser la question, vous auriez pris une décision euh, avec votre libre arbitre, avec votre sensibilité, vos, vos valeurs morales. Et ben, cette décision-là, elle sera prise par la voiture autonome, peut-être, euh, à l'avenir. Cette voiture qui aura été codée euh, conçu pour prendre une décision dans ce genre de cas. Et donc ça, ça ouvre quand même des, des perspectives assez, euh, assez effrayantes, puisqu'on on se rend compte qu'on est dans un... On, on, de plus en plus, on est en train de construire un monde qu'on n'est plus en mesure de comprendre. Les algorithmes qui dirigent aujourd'hui les marchés financiers, euh, les, la valeur, euh, des, des, les prix des, ma des matières premières, ou même euh, ce qui est diffusé comme publicité en ligne, c'est des algorithmes que la plupart d'entre nous ne peuvent pas comprendre. Et ça pose quand même un, un souci de vivre dans un monde dans lequel on est entouré de zones d'ombre, dans lequel on est entouré de robots et d'algorithmes qui fonctionnent comme des boîtes noires. Et c'est bien pour ça euh, qu'il faut, euh, faut absolument changer d'approche. Et c'est à ça qu'on travaille euh, chez DataVice. Euh, il faut changer d'approche sur au moins trois sujets. Le premier, c'est la question du sens. Euh, les données, euh, c'est quelque chose qui doit contenir beaucoup de sens. Et notre capacité à faire ressortir ce sens, elle est très importante. Le langage habituel des données, c'est le langage des mathématiques ou du code, et c'est un langage qui n'est pas maîtrisé par la plupart d'entre nous. Et donc, il est très important d'adopter un nouveau langage des données, un langage qui soit plus heuristique, un langage qui soit tout simplement mieux compris par les humains, pour qu'on devienne plus capable de s'approprier cette matière première-là. La visualisation de données, c'est exactement l'objet de cette discipline. C'est de traduire de façon visuelle, de façon interactive éventuellement, des éléments compliqués contenus dans les données, pour que ces données deviennent beaucoup plus faciles à comprendre. C'est essayer de permettre à l'humain, en s'adressant pas forcément à sa logique verbale et, et, et purement rationnelle, de comprendre l'information qu'il y a dans les données. Et par exemple, avec, euh, avec mon équipe, lorsqu'on travaille euh, sur un, un projet de visualisation des données euh, de, de notation des, états, des hôpitaux en France, euh, c'est un projet sur lequel on a pu travailler, et ben on va transformer des données très, très compliquées, très technocratiques, en une plateforme sur laquelle des citoyens, quel que soit leur niveau, vont pouvoir s'informer sur leur hôpital, sur la qualité des soins, comparer des hôpitaux. Il y a un deuxième axe qui est très important dans, dans notre approche des données, c'est celle de l'usage, c'est celle de l'utilisateur final. Parce que finalement, le, ces données elles ne deviennent intéressantes que quand elles passent dans les mains de quelqu'un, quand elles permettent à quelqu'un de faire quelque chose, quand elles passent dans le cerveau de quelqu'un. Et l'objectif, c'est d'essayer de construire des systèmes qui utilisent les données pour nous permettre d'avoir une meilleure capacité de prise de décision, pour nous permettre d'améliorer notre libre arbitre. C'est l'idée de construire des systèmes qui augmentent l'humain, plutôt que de construire des systèmes qui prennent des décisions à notre place. Donc ça, c'est par exemple des choses qu'on travaille au quotidien. Euh, en ce moment, on travaille par exemple sur le sujet des transports en commun et des cartes dans, dans le métro. Alors on peut faire des cartes qui montrent l'état du réseau, qui montrent là où il y a des problèmes, des blocages, des ralentissements, qui vont nous aider à prendre une décision bah, sur comment est-ce qu'on se rend d'un endroit à un autre. 
mais on peut aussi, euh, c'est l'approche qu'on a retenue, faire des cartes où on va intégrer la ville euh, au-delà du réseau. Et qu'est-ce qui se passe dans la ville Où est-ce qu'il y a euh, des, des événements en train de se passer Où sont les gens Et qui donc vont essayer de nous amener à prendre une décision, bah, pas seulement en fonction de l'état du réseau, mais aussi en fonction de la vie de la ville. Et ça, c'est un point important, la question de l'usage au niveau, des, au niveau des, des individus, mais c'est aussi un point très important au niveau des entreprises. Euh, parce qu'en fait, ce qu'on est en train de constater aujourd'hui, euh, c'est que beaucoup de grandes entreprises s'équipent dans des, des, euh, des outils pour traiter leurs données, pour valoriser leurs données. Et pour autant, eh ben, ça ne se voit pas beaucoup euh, dans, dans les usages de l'entreprise et ça ne se voit pas beaucoup dans leur gain de productivité. Et ça, c'est un paradoxe qu'on a déjà vu. Euh, à la fin des années 80, ça a été, euh, ça a été euh, présenté par Robert Solo, euh, qualifié comme le paradoxe de la productivité, qui consistait à dire qu'en fait, on voit de l'informatique partout dans les entreprises, sauf dans les chiffres de productivité. Parce qu'en fait, ce qui permet de, de résoudre ce paradoxe-là, ben, c'est tout simplement l'usage. Euh, effectivement, si vous équipez à la fin des années 80 les entreprises avec des ordinateurs, mais qu'au final, on continue à imprimer les mails sur papier et à travailler sur papier, il n'y a pas l'usage qui va avec la technologie, et donc ça ne change pas grand-chose dans la façon dont travaillent les gens. Et ben, c'est exactement pareil pour les données. C'est-à-dire que, effectivement, les grandes entreprises peuvent faire beaucoup d'investissements dans des technologies big data. Elles peuvent s'équiper de data centers, elles peuvent s'équiper de, de chaînes de traitement de données compliquées. Mais à un moment, si elles ne réfléchissent pas à la question de comment les salariés et les membres de ces organisations vont utiliser les données dans leur métier, comment ça va vraiment changer la façon dont les gens travaillent, ben, ça n'aura pas beaucoup d'intérêt. Et enfin, et pour terminer, le troisième axe sur lequel il faut changer d'approche, c'est un axe, c'est l'axe de la gouvernance, c'est l'axe de la déontologie. Parce qu'effectivement, il y a des enjeux économiques importants dans l'utilisation des données, dans l'utilisation des données personnelles en particulier. Et ça, méritera, enfin, ça mériterait qu'on se pose vraiment la question en mettant les acteurs autour de la table. Et ça va forcément amener des questions de régulation, la production de normes. Et ce sujet-là, c'est justement ce sujet-là que les entrepreneurs seuls ne peuvent pas résoudre dans leur coin. Et c'est justement sur ce sujet-là qu'on a tous, tous besoin de vous autour de, autour de cette table. Merci. Good afternoon. My name is Pierre. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Open Classrooms, a Paris-based startup company. It's um, about education. Today we've heard discussions about the pace of change in today's world and in the global economy. To embrace these changes, education is key. The world of tomorrow needs new knowledge, new skills. Companies need digital skills, and they need them right now. By the end of the year, there'll be 750,000 unfilled digital jobs in the UK alone. The digital skills gap is already estimated to cost the UK economy 63 billion pounds a year, 63 billion pounds. These are the figures for the UK alone. The European Digital Progress Report says almost half of the people in the EU do not have basic digital skills. And studies show that 70% of the jobs in 2050 don't exist right now. This is a worldwide problem. Education needs to evolve to become closer aligned to tomorrow's needs. Populism spreads in less educated populations in, in regions with high unemployment rates. We need to fight this with a better education system. Education. So what about education today? There are three main problems with the status quo when it comes to equipping people with the right knowledge and the right skills that industry is crying out for. First of all, it's a problem of scale. We need to train hundreds of millions of people for digital skills and new skills in general. Right now, the current system cannot produce enough 
people with the right qualifications and skills. And when the curriculum exists, it isn't quick enough to produce them. It's a matter of scale and speed. Secondly, it's way too expensive. Therefore, access is limited. Tuition fees can reach as much as 100,000 US dollars for a degree. This is way too much. And last but not least, there needs to be a much stronger link between learning and employment. Today, recent graduates are struggling to find work that matches their skills. In fact, one in three are now employed in low-skilled jobs. One in three. Is that worth investment in time and money? I don't think so. So what do we need to, to do to close this skills gap? We need to widen access to education. We need to provide the best education to millions of people. We need to do it at a fraction of the cost. But not only that, we need to combine great, highly relevant educational content with a new form of pedagogy. We need the model that enables people to gain mastery of often difficult technical subjects. Because we must not only target undergraduates, but also workers, job seekers. This education has to be flexible and highly personalized so people can get, learn the specific skills they need in the way that suits them best. Finally, we have to ensure that the qualifications they achieve have real meaning and wide acceptance. We need widely recognized certifications and degrees. These are the lessons we learned by founding and growing open classrooms since 2013. It's still a young journey, but our experience goes back to 1999. And as you can see, I'm still pretty young. I was a sixth grader back then. My co-founder and I create and publish free online courses for 17 years. We now train three million people every month. Our vision for open classrooms is very simple. To make the best education for tomorrow's skills accessible for everyone. What we all need to achieve here is nothing less than a revolution in the way that anyone, anywhere, can access the skills needed in today's industry, workplace, and the wider global economy. We need education that anyone can access and afford, fully online, with no prerequisites. We must move towards a better pedagogical model. We do not seek to throw out everything that's great about traditional education. For example, we recognize that success depends not just on great content, but more on the educator that helps you, mentors you. Individual mentorship is one of the most efficient pedagogy, and we know that in the 80s, thanks to Benjamin Bloom's research on education sciences. But we must not talk exclusively about models, important that they are. We deal with people, people like Rolly from Gabon. Rolly decided to take one of our basic courses in web development, but found it so useful, he decided to undertake full certification. He applied to a fully online, first ever bachelor's degree. No prerequisites. And he's now just a few weeks away from completing. 
it will be awarded a European bachelor's degree without leaving Gabon, Munich, and he already got a job. He's one of our students, and they are the pioneers of the future of education. They are leading the way. They are showing businesses, policymakers, governments, universities, educators, how we can all solve the education crisis and bring out a new model that is much cheaper and far more accessible for everyone. And when I say cheaper, I don't mean 20% cheaper. I mean 10 times cheaper. We must be ambitious, and together we must create the university of the future, where real education, qualifications, degrees are delivered in a wide range of new ways, in settings as diverse as schools, universities, in the workplace, or at home. When people talk about an education crisis, I don't see that. I see an opportunity for all of us in this room. That is the real challenge we face. How we together can help people to achieve the career, the life that until now has been out of reach. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and uh, good afternoon ladies and gentlemen. I'm Isa al Manai from Reach Out to Asia, a non-for-profit organization uh, based in Qatar Foundation that focuses on providing quality education for needy communities around Asia. But uh, locally in Qatar, our focus is on um, youth uh, community service and volunteerism. Um, so it's been really interesting to hear uh, my colleagues uh, within the panel uh, talking about um, <coughs> the world today and how technology is really um, er erupting, but also uh, not only that, you know, uh, drones are available within everyone's hands, but also how information is changing cities. We're, we're hearing about, uh, you know, uh, smart cities, but also education and how education is evolving. But um, my input within this session would be about how about the people, the people who are going to live within those cities. And a number of years from now, once we are too old, that someone will have to push us in a wheelchair. You know, how about that person? Who is he and she? And how engaged are they in the shaping of that world? So I'm going to talk about the youth. And um, since we're talking about governance and policies, um, I'm going to refer to the World Humanitarian Summit that uh, Reach Out to Asia have uh, supported uh, in the coordination um, and implementation of the youth uh, and the youth consultation leading to the humanitarian summit in Istanbul and hearing their voice about how the humanitarian sh uh, system uh, should be changed. So I'll leave you with this uh, video that takes around three and a half minutes. We are hoping to engage finally youth in the policy for UN and finally to have some concrete action plan for youth. It's not easy to get people excited about running such a major youth forum globally and I'm just delighted that we've been able to include youth in our consultations. This event will provide, hopefully, a platform for youth to enhance their knowledge on current global and regional challenges to meet the humanitarian needs and facilitate discussions on youth contribution to humanitarian actions. 
We see them in every conflict all across the world, from Latin America to the Middle East to everywhere. So it's getting, you know, so far from the real core of the issue that we are talking about human life. So we, we, we need to shift this. This youth consultation is, in fact, the first since a quarter century. And this acknowledgement for the role of young people, I think the message of the youth of the world who are gathered here in Doha, that it's time to engage them in a strategic way, not only as beneficiaries or refugees, but also as partners and the early responders who are going to connect the dots from the early response of a crisis to helping the recovery and the road to recovery is all about youth. I think it's very important that youth are the ones that are speaking and finding solutions because there's something that older, like the older generation lack, which is communication. And thankfully, that's the, the main focus that we have as youth, Communic like really strong communication skills. We have experienced the change that has been taking place in our world. But this is only a milestone, and this is not the end. We'll be discussing a lot of different ideas it that is Brian... campaigning and lobbying and advocating and writing to your members of parliament, right? And at REACT, we basically said, what is Grota's youth's uh, legacy? The last two days have been a historical event uh, during this turn of uh, reshaping the world humanitarian uh, agenda uh, for the 2016 summit in uh, Turkey. Uh, Rota has been very privileged and proud to be an active partner during this dialogue. So the advocate for the youth vote. We have very concrete outcome in terms of a position paper. In this position paper, we uh, try to articulate what are the different issues, why are they related to youth, and what would be the concrete action that youth can do uh, to solve the humanitarian crisis. I am very confident that uh, humanitarian issues are in good hands for the future. Well, uh, my apologies, it seems that there has been some um, uh, technological problem between the pictures and the sound. But um, I'll go back to my presentation. So the, the youth have voiced their opinions, and out of the Doha Youth Declaration, uh, 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 the youth consultations came, the Doha Youth Declaration on reshaping uh, humanitarian work, humanitarian system, putting youth at the center of um, uh, the humanitarian work. Uh, this is available online if you would look for it. And it has been discussed um, on a high level uh, panel discussion uh, in the humanitarian summit. But taking some scripts from the declaration itself, uh, we can hear that the youth themselves are asking basically to be uh, put not just as in the, side, in the other side of the table as a recipient of, um, of the humanitarian work, but more as an active, engaged, responsible player within the process itself, from putting the policies, from the preparedness, from the response, recovery, uh, monitoring and evaluation, and all spectrums of, um, uh, of the process. In addition to engaging the young people, uh, that youth ha bring a unique perspective and insight as they are uh, more adaptive to fast evolving uh, systems. And my colleagues from the panel have talked about how fast the world is changing around us when it comes to technology and all of the things that, we are, that are becoming um, uh, a day-to-day -day activities within our um, daily life. So looking from an NGO's perspective, and how did we make it uh, this far? How did we look into engaging and governing uh, youth programs uh, within our work? So looking at our programs, thinking about engaging youth, we came to realize that we shouldn't just provide services and programs. Actually, the best way to engage youth is to get them to serve youth. So the youth should be the ones who are leading, 
the processes. So within government, within governance, ownership is, 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 a, is a task thing, you know, is a main thing when it comes to uh, youth engagement. This is why we had a Rota Youth Advisory Board, uh, uh, 14 members of actively uh, uh, engaged youth as the ones who would say yes to the programs that they want, how these programs would look like, and who should be engaged, and how does the program look like. Um, through starting the loop basically on a leadership training program where they will be equipped with the skills and the toolkits on what is community service, what is global citizenship, and how is the world is changing. So we would equip them with the knowledge that they need. So from knowledge then we move to action. And through action we have the Rota Youth Service Clubs where the youth can, will divide themselves after this training that's given for 40 youth into clubs and each club will have a main mission, a, a main uh, idea or a program that's based on community service that they would like to make. And then comes advocacy. So knowledge, action, and then advocacy and how they could be more of the vocal, uh, of the voice of the change that we want to make through an annual conference which is called Empower. So where they will be able to come and to discuss and learn from each other. And then we have also a United Nations General Assembly task forces, uh, advocacy task forces, and also um, side events that we'll held for them to come into those international platforms and see and shape the change themselves. So the Rota Youth Advisory Board, um, this is a picture of the uh, members from the advisory board, and you can see gender equality is something that we take into consideration. Uh, but also uh, the leadership training, and the same thing you can see. Well, the United Nations uh, defines youth as from the age of 15 to 25. With the Reach Out to Asia, we stretched it a little bit from 15 to 30. Now, looking around us here in the room, I wonder each one, if we have anyone from that age, 15 to 25, okay, so, or 20 to 30, maybe. Okay, so we have two. Three, so only three in that room, and we're talking about international governance, and you too. That, uh, sorry, I sorry, I missed you. <laughs> but okay. so we have four, maybe. But anyway, youth maybe is in the heart, not uh, a number of age. But this this is an eye-opening thing for us here is that we're talking about how the world is changing, but those who are going to live in it are not here in that room, and this is what the declaration is about is about including them as a person, as responsible, committed citizens who will be able and responsible in shaping that world. <clears throat> and this is Empower, the Empower Conference um, that we take. It started as a very small conference, and then from the power and the engagement of the youth, now for the ninth year, it, uh, it expanded of becoming regional and now international. Um, the youth also, as um, uh, delegates in the United uh, Nations General Assembly. But talking about that, and apart from our programs, it's not just about the programs. With governance, also has to be based with a very strong monitoring and evaluation framework that you will have to get the youth engaged in into it. And monitoring and evaluation is, just n is not just a checklist where you will take into things into considerations and KPIs and you'll put. It's a very lengthy process that requires true engagement and ownership from all stakeholders, from planning the results to collecting the data, the data quality assurance, to analyzing them, storing the data, uh, reporting the results, using the data when it comes to advocacy and um, PR and media, um, to the evaluation, and also then disseminating the results. And, if you, uh, and one of the lessons that we've learned is that me and my team can do almost the minimum when it comes to our youth programs, when it comes to that. Within our Empower Conference, even the registration uh, is done through um, a committee and, a, and an interview panel that me and my team, we do not interview the youth. We actually have a youth panel that has been trained on interviewing skills who interviews the youth and they are the ones who says who comes to the conference and who doesn't. That boosts the energy and boosts the ownership of the conference. Even our Twitter and Instagram account, we give it to a youth media panel. And within the last three conferences, 
our conference would trend as internationally as you know the the, the uh, sometimes it even goes to number one trending topic worldwide. We even bet Lady Gaga. Can you imagine that? It's only through the power of youth that you will be able really to showcase how this ownership looks like, but also advocacy and shaping their voice on how they want to see the, the world look like. And again, it didn't happen overnight. It started uh, on our strategy. How did we want this engagement to look like? And then the early years of Empower and how did we develop uh, a team, a small team of dedicated youth who would then take over the ownership of the, and mobilization of these programs. And then four years of Empower Conference leading to a, a youth advocacy campaign holding the, uh, holding the uh, consultation summit here in Doha, taking it back to Istanbul, and now we are, uh, and now the conference is even uh, in, a, in a much better shape. And finally, um, uh, proper planning and uh, more engagement of youth. And as you can see, from each Empower conference from uh, 2012 and 14, Post the uh, intergovernmental negotiations that took place in uh, 2015 in New York, and then the first week of September holding the youth consultation here in Doha, then the, uh, another Empower conference where the, the Youth Advocacy T Task Force continues it, continued its work, and then they went together to Istanbul within the high-level session, and then, you know, uh, coming back to another Empower, and then now is the discussion on what's going to happen after the World Humanitarian Summit. So these are some of the lessons learned that we have you know, um, from our programs that we move forward. And we also have some handouts on the governance structure that we have and the monitoring and evaluation that comes in parallel with it for whoever wants to take a copy of that. But um, I'll end my note with basically um, the main uh, lesson that we learned you know, when it comes to uh, youth engagement um, in our programs. It's basically true belief on, on youth as the uh, owners of um, uh, their programs, uh, true engagement. With engagement comes ownership, and then from ownership comes sustainability. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you everybody. So we've run through a whole huge range of issues, um, starting with accelerated change technology and how that lands in uh, how that connects with political economy issues and populism. Uh, then Daniel discussed issues of tech and accelerated change, and you saw a few of the technologies that he's working on, which might have a big impact on productivity, also on jobs and others, we can discuss that. Also trust in transactions and others, the use of data, breaking um, echo chambers and informing people properly, and ultimately investments in human capital across the board. I have a few questions. We only have nine minutes, so I was wondering if there were any questions in the room, and we might, we might just collect uh, a couple. There's one in the back there, Mark. Marc Ecker de l'IPRI, une question pour Caroline Goulard sur un point spécifique de sa présentation, qui est le pouvoir de prévision des big data. Effectivement, lors des élections américaines de 2008 et de 2012, on avait beaucoup parlé d'une nouvelle science électorale américaine qui permettrait de prévoir les résultats de manière beaucoup plus fine que les sondages. Et cette année, on a vu que les sondages ont échoué, mais également euh, le pouvoir de prévision des big data. Donc j'aimerais savoir si vous pouvez nous expliquer pourquoi les big data ont échoué à ce point-là lors de cette élection. Merci. Um, merci. Uh, that's quite simple at the end. Prediction is statistics. So when you say there is 98% uh, Hillary is elected, there is still 2% that uh, Donald Trump is elected. And the problem with election is that we can't reprodu reproduce the event lots of time to see if the prediction is okay. So you just have one event, and it can be on the 80% that, that were sure, but it also can be on the 2% that were not. So predictions and modelization, it's still a way to be close to the reality that there is still error margin. And Maybe the problem is that when you communicate survey uh, results, you not, the media don't um, insist on this error margin. And it can 
make the difference. There's another, there's another question back there. Thank you very much to all of you for these very inspiring uh, remarks. I have a question about the youth uh, that, we, that you talked a lot about uh, today. So what struck me in recent elections or referendum that you've seen is that is two things. First of all, that the youth, are, uh, the youth turnout is the lowest amongst age groups generally. Uh, but conversely, what you see is that the youth overwhelmingly vote for a choice that eventually loses. So you can think about Hillary, you can think about remaining in Europe. Uh, so my question is, how would you ensure what would be your solutions to make sure that the youth get more involved into politics, into global issues, and have their voice uh, eventually heard? Who, who wants to take that, Nesha, or uh, do you want to go ahead? At the, at the end of the... Okay. Um. I think that the, the reason why, one of the reasons why the young people are not voting is they don't trust the system. And when, when we can see in uh, the populism growing everywhere from Trump to Marine Le Pen to everywhere in Europe, is we don't trust the system anymore. We don't trust the information. What Caroline just spoke about in, in the US about the, 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 the Facebook algorithm is no one is trusting the system anymore. I think by building trust, uh, uh, you believe in technology, they natively believe in technology. So if we all together make that the technology through blockchain, for example, I don't know if blockchain is familiar, but there are ways to make sure that information that is on internet make it more reliable, trust the information, to identify. In China, for example, it's now very difficult to publish an information if you are not identified. Anonymous uh, uh, blogs are now forbidden. And I think this is a step forward. I think we need to build trust in the digital world and we speak to use through the digital world. Can I, um, can I add a quick comment? So on the Brexit debate, I know this was on the press quite a bit that the youth ca had voted against Brexit, but actually if you look at the detail of the data, most of the youth that voted, voted in prosperous areas. So we are unsure what youth in other areas uh, would have voted, but there seems to be a very strong correlation between income per capita and supporting Brexit. So if you were below 30, 30 40,000 pounds a year, you were, you were very likely to be on the Brexit comes. So the, the economic connection between these things is quite strong. On the age side, on Brexit, it's unclear. And also in the US, a lot of the youth supported uh, Bernie Sanders, which was sort of, again, an anti-establishment, anti-system uh, candidate. Many people saw him that way. I think he was very, very radical. So the youth is kind of split. And, and the youth, I think, is gonna suffer a lot of, of the consequences of this change unless we deal with issues of education and others. I was reading a fascinating piece the other day about how in a world where returns on capital are so significant, it is capital holders that do quite well and you have a major development issue problem because when you enter the jobs market, you have very little savings, hence very little capital. So unless you're a very successful entrepreneur from the very beginning, you have a, a lot of issue getting your hands on capital. So there's actually, uh, there's, it's very difficult for you to accumulate wealth, so the youth are going to be hit quite hard by some of these dynamics unless we deal with part of the education issues and, and others. I don't know, Essa, did you have, did you want to add something on the youth or do you want to, more questions? Yeah, uh, any more questions around the room? There's one here. Uh, thank you very much, Tatsuma from Japan. Thank you very much for very invigorating discussion. And I feel the pulse of younger generation here. Thank you for all. Uh, one question to uh, Sa from Qatar. You know, there people of our age talk about fault lines between East and West or clash of civilizations or a division between the different 
ethnic groups, so sort of things. But judging from what you did, your communication and skill and combining all these people, your generation don't feel anything like division between the East and the West or fault line of uh, cultures. What is actually day-to-day -day feeling of, of those things our generation are talking about? Are we already outdated in that? Thank you. So this, this will be the last question, and you have the last word. OK. Well, um, thank you for referring to me as one of the younger generations. But one of the, uh, I think, um, perks of being born in 1979 is that I was the six years old kid who's played the Nintendo Entertainment System. I was a teenager who's played the PlayStation 1, you know? I was the one who played Mario and saw my neighbor Taturo and, you know, all of these things. Uh, we lived in a time being Generation X where we have witnessed the evolution and uh, of uh, the internet and how the, the world has become uh, a, uh, you know, uh, a small uh, village. Um, my generation in itself, you know, I mean, uh, we, we uh, you know, and even uh, looking at my son, uh, uh, even though I consider myself as a global citizen, I got really shocked when I look at younger generations. For example, my, my, my one years old son looked into the newspaper one day when I was sitting, and he started scratching by his finger thinking it was an iPad. And it was a strange thing for me looking at how the world is changing. But things like, for example, um, uh, differences among different cultures, even going to their schools, it's been so globalized in a way that, you know, even we became now um, a bit worried about our own identity, about our own culture. I personally believe that, uh, you know, um, it's a good thing to see that, you know, the world is becoming one village. But are we going to, to, to become from, you know, uh, white, black, gray, to all yellow, maybe? We don't know. But uh, there, are, there are two sides of that equation that we look. But it's definitely becoming uh, a more open world that people are more accepting towards each other. Thank you. Well, thank you, everybody, for being in the panel. Thank you for being in the room. I think we have a short uh, coffee break and then the final, the final plenary. Thanks a lot.